Okay, my wonderful students, let's begin lecture. And I'll just draw your attention to this quote from Abraham Lincoln. You know, everybody always thinks, oh, Abraham Lincoln, very serious guy. I mean, this, this, is kind of a, this is kind of one of his funny sayings. Whenever I hear anyone arguing for slavery, I feel a strong impulse to see a try to him personally. So that's, that's Abe Lincoln. The fam he was a famous, famous jokester and storyteller, and he, you could tell it. You could tell, tell a good story there. All right, we're going to talk about orbits and stuff today. And just to let you know kind of where we're heading next, uh, your homework this weekend is going to be to study into Chapter 7 and 8, uh, 8.1. You should be able to savvy 8.1 even if you totally skip over Chapter 7 uh, because 8.1 is about Newton's second law and skateboarders and stuff, you know, skateboard interactions. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's ahead. Now, before we do any of that, get back to... Uh, the theory of universal gravitation. I want to go through a participation points example with you so that you will know how to estimate your semester grade. You know, the semester grade, right now we have two midterms on the books. Oh, by the way, I just, boy, there's a ton of people absent today. Too bad I, I wish I could give bonus points somehow. <laughs> The only, the only problem is, I see somebody up here going, uh, the only problem is, in, in addition to forgetting my, the reason I forgot my microphone is because I forgot my clicker apparatus. Aww. You know, in my little bag, so I, <laughs> turn it in on paper? Yeah. No! <laughs> oh! No, 300 pages. 300 papers to grade? No. Anyways, I'll just, I'll, I'll figure out some way of uh, kind of use it. I'll, I'll figure out some way of doing this in reverse, reusing reverse psychology. All right. Um, the exam to Scantron is the, the score is up, and it's published in your grades page. Uh, I, however, was warned or alerted to the fact that exam one, written problem scoring, was slightly messed up for a few students. All right, so I hope you have kept the, that, that one, it's actually one page from exam one that has your written uh, the scores on it for your written work. Uh, we're going to have to, I don't know what we're going to do with that, but we're going to have to revise some of those grades. So I'm aware of that. Um, as, um, as to uh, clicking the participation grade, we're going to do an example. Um, and the data on the books right now is lecture 7 through lecture 19. Prior to Lecture 7, we were just doing practice sessions and stuff. Uh, and this doesn't include exam days. And I think there was one day that we didn't ha actually have a lecture. So, And there weren't any lectures when Dr. Schulte, or, or excuse me, there weren't any clicking sessions when Dr. Schulte was here or Dr. Dubé. So, uh, but, but we're going to go over that right now. So what I want you to do, if you want to estimate your grade right now, you can't, we can't do any homework. You know, the grade is a mess. Uh, the homework is a headache, but the entire grade is a mess because you have to factor in your, your lab grade, and I have no idea what your lab grades are, although you may. So uh, what we're going to do is figure out how to calculate 12 points out of 240 that you get from participation. I don't know we're going to do an example of it right now. But you also have 72 points on the books. 72 possible from the two midterms. And some of you have a bunch of homework points. It, the homework, I don't even know what to do with yet. I still am thinking about it. Actually, I have a plan, but I don't want to unveil my secret plan until next week. And then lab, I don't know. That, that's going to be, 
48 points. So if you know what your lab grade is, here's what you want to do. If you know what your lab grade is in terms of a percentage, multiply it by 48 and then round up. And then add, so that's going to be somewhere between 0 and 48 points. And then add in your exam 1, add in your exam 2, and then add in your pointage that you're going to figure out today for clicking. All right, I'll show you how to do it. And uh, that'll be 84 plus 48 is 124, 132. So divide by 132, and that'll be your percentage, your estimate of your grade right now. But it's, it's you know, kind of not very reliable because we don't have any homework in there yet. But you can at least get an eyeball of what you've got. If you're, if you're doing good, then, you know, on that basis, then that'll be happy. All right, let's take a look at what you got in your grades page right now. You, you may have noticed this already. Down below your exam two grade, which is now published, uh, there's a, it says round up as of 220, and then answer as of 220, and then, so here's round up, and then here's answer, and down here is the number correct. So what I've done is the round up uh, number that everybody, ha almost everybody has, encodes how many questions you've answered and how many of them you've actually answered correctly. Uh, so for this one, and just as a side note, um, if, you, if, if your roundup number is something point one, that's actually something point ten. That means you have ten answers um, answered. Okay, 10 questions answered, like this example student. The problem with web courses, Canvas, is I'll upload 6.10, but it only displays 6.1. I can't get it to, you know, and it, with Canvas, it's Canvas's way or the highway. So. But if you have something point one there in the roundup number, just realize it's something point one zero, okay? Um, out of 16, so 16.16. So we've had 16 questions during the past uh, several lectures of participation, and we'll have more through the semester. And uh, your participation grade is based on this one down here. So whatever you have down here in, in the answered row, um, that is what we're going to work with today. And remember this, you know, if you look at your roundup number, now I've got it modified by hand so that it looks like 6.10. You know, you can always um, look at that number, and that's the one I usually publish, and then just construct you know, how many you got correct, and then how many you got answered, all right? So that the roundup, and I'll, I'll publish the roundup, you know, a few, a few more times this semester, you know, every two or three weeks. By the way, Monday is the halfway point of the semester. It's going fast. All right, so let's work out this particular student's uh, pointage. Now, there's 16 questions, and this student, John Q. student, has answered 10 of them. He got six correct. By the way, why do I keep a track of how many you get correct? The answer to that is, if you answer 75% of the questions correctly at the end, by the end of the semester, you know, so let's say I have 100 questions by the end of April, and you've answered 75 of them correctly, you get four bonus points on your semester grade. So that's, that's a nice chunk, of, nice chunk of change. And for those of you, for those of you that have biffed, um, you know, one or two lectures, don't forget, it's 85%. That's the... That's the criterion by which we signify full participation. So if you've got 85% of the questions answered, um, you get full pointage. Uh, can somebody do that? I, I forgot to do it before class. What's 65% of 16? Let's see. It's 13, 12.8. What is it? 85, what is it? 10.4. Okay, so if you have 11 or more, Right now, you're above 85%. Okay? And so you just, just
just pencil yourself in for 12 points in your semester grade. If you're lower than that, like this student is, 13.6? Yeah, 85% is 13.6. Okay, so, so I meant that. So if you have 14 or more, so if you have 14, 15, or 16 questions answered, you're above 85%. Just pencil yourself in for 12. If you're below that, you've got to do a little calculation question. It's my, oh yeah, if you have a minus one, is that what you, some of you have a minus one for your roundup figure, that means your clicker's not registered, I don't know who, I don't know what you got, but you know what, if you, if, if you have a minus one, and we dismiss a few minutes, and actually, whatever we dismiss, come on up front, we can maybe figure it out what the problem is on the roster, I've done it for a few students in my other class, I'll probably have to do it for, for some of you. So what else were you asking? Yeah. I don't know what to tell you. The answer, you may have answered, you know, the thing is, you may have answered uh, too late or, you know. So it's, uh, yeah, everybody's going to, nobody's going to, you know, you may think, I, I've got all the data that you transmitted s successfully by the time I counted down. You know how I always count down to 10? You know, if you don't get it in by then, you know, you, you know. So that's probably, if you're, if you're not at 16 out of 16, or at least 16 answered, you know, if you don't have a something point 16, then that means you, you didn't answer one of them or more. But it's usually because, uh, oh, you know what else it is? If you're sitting way up in the back, sometimes they don't click all the way down the front. That's why I always like people to sit, you know. But like the guys in the, uh, up there behind the, yeah, you're, you're leaning back like no problem. But uh, I have had students that it clicks up. It doesn't, it doesn't register up there, but they come down the aisle a little bit and it starts to click. It starts to register. So... That's, you know, it's, it's a pain in the neck, but. So what we do with the answers figure is we convert it to 12 points for your semester grade. Question. The bonus points, the early, We're not doing good here. We want, what you want to do is listen. The early iClicker registration points uh, are not all up, but they, they will be. And we're not, I'm not talking about any of that today. I mean, that's a separate issue. But those will be uh, updated as well. I've got some, some updated to do on that. So let's work out this example for John Q. Student. And if you ever get to this point, you know, this is how you do it. So as of Tuesday, we had 16 clicker items. Um, and John Q. student has 10 of them. He's answered 10. That's 62.5% participation. So he's below 85%. And so what that means is we've got to work out uh, his proportion. So um, he got six of them correct. Uh, so what I do is I post this roundup figure 6.10 for that John Q. student in web courses, and, and that encodes his answers, the number that he's answered in the decimal part, as I already showed you, and the number that he gets correct in the whole number part. Right? So I'll publish that roundup figure, and you'll break it apart into two separate numbers, um, the number that you've answered and the number that you have correct. The number that you answered is the one that we use to calculate uh, the uh, participation points. Now, he's below 85%, so you have to solve a proportion. And just like I said in the, uh, the, uh, the syllabus, here's the proportion. Go ahead and jot this down. Uh, you, what you do is you write down John Q. student's percentage, divide by 85%, and then on the other side you have his pointage, and then divide by 12. So you have a proportion, 
And hopefully that makes sense to you that you get 12 points for 85% participation and anything below 85% is proportional. Uh, so here's what it looks like for John Q. student. All right, so 62.5%, uh, i.e. 0.625 in the proportion, 0 0.85 in the denominator, and then you got to cross multiply to get his points. So go ahead and do that. Go ahead and calculate that out. Break out your calculator. Figure out how many points. And don't forget, we're going to round up whatever he gets. Um, it's going to round up to the near to the next whole number. You know, so for instance, if you if his pointage comes out to um, 9.00001, then you round it up to 10. All right, so go ahead and do that. And I was going to give this as a clicker question, but I forgot my clicker in my uh, case. So. Leon Chisholm, are you here today? Who's got an answer? Raise your hand if you got an answer. Okay. Raise your hand high. Okay, I see a bunch of you. Uh, okay, you on the aisle over up here. Yeah. What do you? What is your name first? And what's your hometown? Your hometown. Nice, Michelle from Hialeah. What? <laughs> what's your yes? What's your answer? Yeah, good. So 8.85 approximately, and so round it up to 9. All right, so there's your answer. All right, so remember this. Per all you got to do is, you know, figure out what you got from the roundup that I publish in web courses, and then do this, uh, unless you're above 85%. So you always got to figure out, well, what's my 85% level? And if you're above that, you're good. If you're below that, then you got to do this. It's not that you know, bogacious. All right, so you can calculate your participation points uh, like a boss uh, whenever you want. All right, so you never, and I say that to emphasize that you never have to ask me what your participation points are. Although if you do, I'll try to be nice, but um, but you can, you should be able to do it pretty easily. All right, and I'll refer you back to this lecture. Questions about participation points? situation. All right, let's keep going. Last time we were talking about Newton's law of universal gravitation, and I mentioned that the famous astronomer Johannes Kepler, who was, bef you know, Decades before uh, Sir Isaac Newton, um, he figured out that planets don't orbit on perfect circles. You know, he, as many of you know, uh, they actually travel on ellipses. And um, an ellipse, you know, so he was, he was aware of the conic sections, as you might be aware. Uh, from high school or from ever-loving math in this building. Um, the conic sections are circles, ellipses, parabolas, and hyperbolas. And it all depends on the angle at which you take a cross-section of that cone. So you take a cone, a right-angle cone um, of you know, any, any tilt that you want, and then you slice through it. And if you slice through horizontally, perfectly, you get circles. But if you have a, a, a slight angle, you get an ellipse. If you're perfectly parallel to the sides of the cone, you get a parabola. And if you've dipped even below that, you get a hyperbola. And all those are, you know, all those orbits are, um, those are all kosher gravitational orbits. So NASA uses those all the time in this our day. And here's a picture of a guy up at, uh, working on a space station, I guess. Um, I love looking at those pictures. But, you know, NASA uses 
you know, for the space station, you know, the, uh, no, I guess that, that one they launched last night wasn't carrying cargo up to the space station. Or was it? Was it still there yet? It was, it was a Falcon 9. It had a Israelis dropping something on the moon eventually. That was sweet. And then there was a communication satellite. I think there was one other. But I don't think that they were carrying stuff up there. But, you know, you, the whole idea is, you know, you, what NASA wants to do is build enough of a rocket to do the job and, and then no leftovers when they – or not, not too much leftover fuel when they finish the job. Right, because it's really expensive to put every ounce into into orbit. Um, so really expensive. So so here's a you know here's a, a famous diagram from NASA. You know what's the cheapest way to get something to Mars from Earth? Now we definitely want to see. We want to know how to do that because we hope to eventually send um, ourselves up to Mars. You know that movie. You know I just watched it the other the other day. Uh, the Martian with Matt Damon stuck on the on Mars. I actually kind of liked it. I didn't expect to like it, but they, you know, getting out to Mars is not easy and it's very expensive. That movie was uh, a little bit uh, unrealistic in terms of the amount of hardware they had up there on, on Mars. I don't. That's ex extremely expensive to do. You know, put that much. You know, we're we're lucky to, to land. We're happy to land something the size of a toaster oven up on up on Mars. And we got bigger stuff up there now. But some of our early rovers were just like little microwave ovens on wheels for size. But anyway, so what you what do you do? You you take you know this the the Mars orbit. Let me get my cursor over here. So here's your Mars orbit. It's, it's fairly close to a circle. Mars is definitely elliptical. And Mar the orbit of Mars is what, ke what uh, twigged uh, Kepler to the fact that, hey, these things aren't perfect circles. You know, it was definitely noticeable for Mars. But Earth is really close to a perfect circle. So how do you deal with it? How do you get it up there at the cheapest, you know, without, uh, you know, without having to lug so much fuel up there that you don't need? Well, they've figured that out. You take an elliptical orbit to go between the two circular orbits or between the other two orbits if one's not circular. So it's known as the, uh, the Holman transfer orbit. Here's, here's a real sketch. This is for uh, one of the uh, recent devices they sent up there. Um, and here's the Holman transfer orbit. And so it's a transfer from a circular to another uh, orbit. And this blue Holman transfer orbit is an ellipse. And it turns out that you can, using Buku, Trig, and Calculus, you can prove that that's the lowest cost transfer method. If you want to get something fast, you have to have a lot of extra fuel. If you want to get it there most economically, you use the Holman transfer orbit. Here's another one. This is from the Apollo landing. So what they, and you know, the Apollo landing, they had those small landers and stuff. You know, the lunar module, this little bug down here, it didn't carry a lot of fuel. It was a, you know, very, you know, amazing craft, but it, it didn't have a lot of extra fuel and stuff. So they did a home and transfer from the high orbit. So here's the command module where the, the pilots up here using the command module, uh, piloting that thing, and they'll eventually come back and rendezvous. But you know, they they have a point here where they transfer to the home and transfer orbit, and then at this point, that's the dashed line, and then at this point over here at 50,000 feet above the surface of the moon, um, and this is obviously not to scale, but uh, 50,000 feet over the surface of the moon, they transfer to. Uh, powered flight, and then you know, then you're, you know, you, you're not going to be on a, a, you know, all the all the conic sections are free fall, you know, gravitation only. Once you're in powered flight, you know, you can just go left and right and stuff at will. So the last fifty thousand feet, they were actually landing this baby under power, but uh, you can see they've got a delta v up here, ninety eight feet per second. Down here, the speed is. 
uh, what is it, 59, 25 feet per second. So they've got all this, they worked out all this stuff, these orbits. So let's take a look at what Kepler's finding. The first was that the planets orbit the sun on an ellipse, and that the sun is at one of the two foci of the ellipse. Uh, it's not the center of the ellipse, the exact symmetry center. It's at one of the two foci. And the two foci, if you remember from high school, are the two points where, where if you put your two fingers and then you can use a piece of string and a pencil to sketch out an ellipse if the string is always touching your, your two fingers. Uh, and you can read in, ch in chapter 6.6 .6 about that. Uh, anyways, the ellipse, the sun is at one focus, um, and he figured that out from looking at Mars. The other thing he figured out was the equal times and equal areas law. So if you take an orbit and you, you map out a little wedge, so these, these little alternating blue and white wedges, um, if, you're, if you're on an elliptical orbit like this, when you're down here close, this is perihelion, the closest point of approach to the sun. And out here on the right side, right about out here, that's, peri that's uh, aphelion, the furthest point uh, from the sun on the orbit. So out here at aphelion, you're really slow. Over here at perihelion, you're really whipping. So in one hour or one time period, you might cover a huge arc here, but you're really close. So the pi wedge is a lot of degrees, but it's not very deep. Right now, versus out here near aphelion, um, you're cutting through a few degrees. You're still moving, but um, your pi wedge is really deep because you're far out. And so what Kepler figured, I have no idea how he figured this out or why he even thought to figure this out. But he, he, you know, he worked it out for Mars and, and other orbits. Every, you know, so probably for Mars, it was like every month. And Earth, you know, you could do this, what is this? This is 13, so this is about every, every lunar month. Um, figure out the position of the Earth on its orbit and do a pi wedge. And all the pi wedges have the same amount of area, although different shapes. So this pi wedge down here, this blue one, it's got a lot of degrees of sweep, uh, but it's really close to the SUN. That blue one has the same amount of area as this real slippery one. So if you cut up your, your pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving in this way, um, somebody might complain about this pie wedge, but if, they're, if you're following Kepler's second law, this wedge and, and this wedge over here have the same amount of pumpkin pie. So that's where we're... Now, I do not use that. But I'm guessing that some astronomers do use the equal, you know, probably NASA, to tell you the truth, for checking stuff. But here's the big one, the third law. Kepler's third law, F-A-N-T-A-S-T-I-C, fantastic. He figured out that the orbital distance, the or average orbital distance, what we call the semi-major axis of the ellipse, uh, the, the third power of that is proportional to the square of the orbital period. Now that may sound like boring, Dr. B, Kepler, ahoy, it's boring. I just, I just, you know, orbital periods, not really. Here's what it looks like. It's a, it's a physical law. And guess who figured out this version here, down here? P squared, the, the period squared, and then A to the third, that's the semi-major axis, and then a bunch of constants in front of it. So this is like a multipl uh, multiplier out front here. All right now, for the, for the solar system, this all equals 1. But for other star systems, that's when it gets interesting. So Sir Isaac Newton figured this out because he had G. And we now use this when we study binary star systems. You know, we can look at in the galaxy, in, in our galaxy, and so we assume most galaxies, most stars are actually in pairs, orbiting each other. Our star is by itself. 
but many, many, for instance, in the Big Dipper, if you know that constellation, there's, there's uh, tons of double stars, binary stars, in the Big Dipper. Right? Now, the reason that this is helpful is if the stars are close enough, you'll be able to measure the orbital period because you'll see the orbit. And we can see, for instance, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, which you can see in the evening this time of year, uh, Sirius has a companion, a white dwarf companion, and we can track it. We can track both of them. They orbit each other. And we weren't able to see that until the early 1900s, but yes, definitely. So you measure the orbital period, and if you're close enough, you can use parallax or some other method to figure out how far across the orbit actually is, all right? You know, so, so, many, so many light seconds, so many light minutes, so many light hours, whatever it happens to be. So you get the basic distance, A, you get the, you know, you time it, the orbital period, capital P, and then you work out a little bit of trig and stuff, you map out your orbits, and when you do, you can figure out the mass of star number one in your binary star system. And sometimes we see stars that are orbiting another star, but we can't see the other star. And so that's where this, uh, this comes in for black holes. This is how we discovered the first black holes. There's a summertime constellation called Cygnus. There's an X-ray source in the constellation Cygnus, Cygnus X1. There's a blue giant star orbiting. We can't see what it's orbiting, but it's emitting X-rays. And by using this, Kepler's third law, we can figure out the mass of that object that we cannot see that's also generating x-rays. And that is the first black hole that we had reasonable confidence that it actually was a black hole. Now there are other things that are dense that we can't see like neutron stars. Neutron stars, you can get their mass the same way. But if it's a certain mass, and if it's, it's got a certain orbital strength and everything, black hole baby. And we've mapped out, there's, a, there's an enormous one at the center of our galaxy in the constellation Sagittarius. It's like several million times the mass of the sun. And it actually consumes entire stars. And we can see it. We can map the stars orbiting that baby. We can't see it, though. It's a black hole. But we see all the, all the stuff orbiting it. And we say, oh, yeah, Kepler's third law. Bang, there it is. And we know, how, we know the mass. And, we, and so now we know what it's, we know everything about it. You know, we're, we're still studying. We can see it in infrared. We can't see it in optical. We can't see it in visible light. So yeah, Kepler's third law. And this is the version that Sir Isaac Newton developed. You know, Kepler just said P squared equals A to the third. And the, the big square brackets in the solar system equals one. Uh, but for any other star system, you've got to do a little bit of trig and stuff like that. But you can figure it out. Now, Edmund Halley is the one that leveraged this, and he was a friend of, a contemporary of Sir Isaac Newton. And uh, he uh, actually helped Sir Isaac Newton publish the Principia, the principle, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. But he was interested in comets, and you know, Sir Isaac Newton was interested in comets, and he, you know, together they, they knew that comets would follow elliptical orbits and that therefore they would return periodically to, to the inner solar system. So they were guessing that comets went way far out and we lost sight of them for many years and then would come back looping around on their ellipse. And so, um, you know, Edmund Halley had cataloged the times and appearances of many comets uh, from the historical record. And we still are trying to find out more comets from the historical record. And he knew that there were uh, three of them, 1531, 1607, and 1682. And Halley said, you know what, Isaac? I think these are all the same comets. 
and then they come back every 75, 76 years, and he even figured out why it wasn't a perfect 76 years. There's a little bit of variation. And these stars, they, these comets, if they come near Jupiter or Saturn, they get a little bit blooped. You know, they can speed up or slow down a little bit. Right? So he figured that out, too. It's pretty cool. So he said, you know what, Sir Isaac? I predict. And he laid down 20 bucks. Or uh, 20 shillings, or whatever they call them over there. A gold doubloon. And he said, Sir Isaac, it's going to come back in 1758. I might not be here, but it'll be here. And my God, he was right. It did return. Christmas time, 1758. And both of them were gone by that time. But boy, oh boy, this was a huge, huge verification for this theory of universal gravitation. And so put a big check mark next to these two guys. It is important, this prediction of Halley's Comet, because in the olden days, the ancient Greeks, a lot of them, the majority of them, felt that the Earth was the center of the cosmos and that the planets, the moon, and the sun orbited the Earth and that the stars orbit the Earth. And it does look that way. I mean, it's, it's not unreasonable to think that. There were other Greeks that thought, no, the sun is at the center. Right? Now, in the days of the ancient Greeks, they didn't have precise enough telescopes uh, to, to really show that everything's orbiting the sun. But Galileo was able to figure it out. Right? He, was, he invented the use of the telescope as a uh, as an astronomical device. So in the days of the ancient Greeks, this is, the, this is the important part. They thought there were two different sets of laws of nature. One for the mundane. You know what mundane means? That means earthly. From the Latin word uh, uh, M-U-N-D. Uh, and in, in uh, France, what is that? Who here speaks French? Anybody in French? Scaf. Uh, how do you say world in French? Monde. M-O-N-D-E. Yeah. So that's so that we still have that word. So mundane means the earth, you know, earthly things. And the ancient Greeks thought, all right, you know, we're down here, dirty old us on planet Earth, and we have certain, but up there, the beautiful spheres, the celestial spheres, they have their own laws. Now, that's what they thought. But Galileo, he said, you know, I think it's just one book, one book and one set of laws. You know, you can think of Galileo as inventing the idea of a, a real universe, one entire world, where one set of laws applies uh, one set of laws applies to everything in the entire universe stars moon sun everything and so Copernicus the famous astronomer from Poland Kepler from uh, I guess Germany somewhere uh, they actually did a lot of measurements. Kepler was naked eye. He didn't have a telescope until later on when Galileo started using it. But most of Kepler's and, and prior to Kepler, it was all naked eye astronomy. With Galileo, we started using telescopes. Uh, so anyways, Copernicus and Kepler, they worked out. And so we now call it the Copernican view that the planets orbit the S-U-N. And Galileo was the first one to crack it observationally. You know, the whole thing, you know, with Galileo is you've got to be able to measure something or observe something. You can't just blab your mouth about it. You know, some Greek god, you know, uh, you know, Apollo, and he's in a chariot and all this stuff. You've got to be able to observe something. And he used to tell, you know what he, what he found, what cracked it? 
he was able to, if, if it's really true that Venus orbits inside the orbit of the Earth, then you should be able to look at Venus and see crescent phase, just like we see a crescent phase for the moon. Now, for your naked eye, it just looks like a bright point of light. But if you look at it in a telescope or even in a binoculars, you, if it's the right time of the year, you'll see the crescent phase. And that's what Galileo saw. And that busted it. That busted the, the Greek, the, heli, the uh, geocentric view. It, it, at that point, it was in the dustbin of history. And that's what Galileo did. Now, Newton and Halley um, figured out, you know, with this verification, you know, the comet of 1758, uh, that Galileo was right. And that one set of laws does apply across the cosmos to everything. Now look at this photo. This is a photo taken from the mountains of Virginia, Shenandoah National Park, looking at the sun, sunrise. But what is the sun? It's a giant sphere of hydrogen. What are in these clouds and that mist, H2O? All that hydrogen in this water could easily have formed a star. And the star that you see there, that's hydrogen. It's almost all hydrogen, a little bit of helium. And the same laws that govern the hydrogen and H2O on our planet Govern the fact that that huge ball of hydrogen is so dense that at its center, the pressure, the density, and the temperature are so high, it is effectively a thermonuclear bomb that's blazing outward. But there's so much get hydrogen around it, it's all contained gravitationally. So what we got is a star with a hydrogen bomb going off inside that'll never burn out for billions of years. It fuses hydrogen into helium and makes a lot of heat. And all that, that heat gets 93 million miles to us and gives us plants, farms, sunburn if you're, if you're not covered up. And it's the same hydrogen and the same laws. So here's a pull quote. In this model, a small set of rules and a single underlying force explain not only all motions in the solar system, but all other situations involving gravity. The breadth and simplicity of the laws of physics are compelling. As our knowledge of nature has grown, the basic simplicity of the laws has become ever more evident. All right, let's dismiss. Here's your homework assignment. Read through chapter 7 and skim over chapter 8.1. And I'll see you on uh, Monday.